So how do we go about experiencing this abundant life? You know, and finding the answer is going to require you to do some things that most professing believers won't do or have not done, which is to invest your faith to improve your spiritual situation. You must learn how to invest your faith. How do you invest your faith to get the greatest return on your efforts? See, faith is the currency of the kingdom. It is how believers attain the things of life. It is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So how do you invest that faith? You know, unfortunately, most professing believers uh, spend their faith trying to gain material things in this world. God told us in his word not to worry about everyday life. What you going to eat? What you going to wear? So God tells us that man does not live, live by bread alone, but by every word that he's provided for us. So, how do we go about experiencing the abundant life? It's going to require you to invest your faith wisely. Just like money, faith can be wasted on insignificant things. And the key is learning how to invest properly. How to invest your faith. We talk about having faith in God in a lot of things. Uh, but are you investing your faith in the proper things? That's going to give you the return that you're looking for. See, it's God's word that provides the spiritual counsel and training designed to help you invest your faith wisely. It shows you how to add to, how to refine and strengthen your faith and skills and knowledge that is needed to enjoy and experience the abundant life, your faith investment. So what we want to talk about today is we want to discover what investment strategies will give you the greatest return on your faith investment. Properly invested faith has a return of assurance, security, stability, and satisfaction. We want to learn from the Word of God today how to invest our faith wisely. So the topic of our sermon today is going to be Believers, Faith, Investments. Your faith investments as a believer. Because it's your faith that is the thing that must be used to acquire the things in life you desire in the kingdom of God. In our fallen society, money is the thing that they tell us is what we need to get the things we want in life. You say you come looking for a blessing today. That means that you are assured that you have made the right faith investments that's going to return a blessing. And that's the question you have to ask yourself. How have I invested my faith? Did you invest your faith in the proper things to get a return of assurance, security, stability, and satisfaction? Satisfaction is I got more than enough. I got plenty. That's the abundant life, isn't it? Assurance. Don't we all want to know for a certainty that what I'm doing is glorifying God? Isn't that the answer we all want at the end of the day? And every decision, isn't that what you're looking for? The assurance that I'm making the right decision. Aren't you looking for stability? Where things are certain? They're sure, and you're able to take care of life as it should be taken care of. Isn't that your pursuit? In security, you want to feel safe. Some feel safe when they have a fat bank account. But as we've learned over the years, that can be wiped out at any given moment. We're going to be coming from Colossians chapter 3, verses 18 through 25. And it reads, Wives, be subject to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be embittered against them. Children, be obedient to your parents in all things. For this is well-pleasing to the Lord. 
Fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth, not with the external service as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work heartily as for the Lord, rather than for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. It is the Lord Christ whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong, which, had, which he has done, and that without partiality. Believers' faith investment. What investments must you invest in to assure the return in life that all mankind is after? That total peace of mind that you are in line with God, and that life is way. Uh, there may be challenges before you today that are challenging your mindset and your stability and your assurance that you are following God. But what we want to look at today is how to get focused in the right areas with your faith. Because the enemy would use all these things to distract you and start making you try to spend your faith in places that don't make sense. Faith investments. In verse 18, God addresses wives to show them the greatest investment they can make in their lives for abundant living. Wives are told to be subject to their husband, which is fitting in the Lord. Well, what does it mean to be subject? And why is that fitting? What does it mean to be subject? Why is be subject to your husband? The, the Greek term carries the meaning of being under obedience. So wives, you are told to be under the obedience of your husband. But why is that thing? Come on, my husband. Have you, do you know my husband? Do you understand the issues that he had? Surely you don't mean all husbands. And I know we've never experienced any kind of thought, and I know this sounds like foreign language to you, but there are those out there that struggle with such a demand a command because they just can't see how their husbands can lead them anywhere productive or safe with assurance, stability, or security. Aren't you glad you've been born again? Amen. <laughs> that you have been delivered from all these distractions that the enemy will put in your mind to show you how you think we could attain security. Abundance. Stability and satisfaction. Well, you just act like a little child and say to your husband, Yes, Lord. Isn't it awesome? Because that's what Sarah did, isn't it? And you are Sarah's daughters, aren't you? If you are children of faith, which is your investment in life. Are you hearing what I'm trying to tell you today? Because we're trying to shine a little bit of light. On how we should invest yeah. properly yeah. to get a great return. How could you get such a return from such an investment as obedience to your husband? Because you've lived with him. We only see him on the outside, right? Mm -hmm. So why is I told to obey their own husbands? You notice how he said that? Your own husband. There are a lot of husbands out there. Wives, but you are too vain to submit to your own husband. Mm. Wow. Not the first lady's husband. <laughs> Not your friend's husband. Not your mama's husband. <laughs> Are you hearing what I'm saying? Not the TV husband. Not Bill Cosby. That's somebody else's husband. So don't bring their advice and instruction to your home in talking with your husband. Regardless of how good it sounds, he's not equipped right to receive it that way. 
That is why he says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 23, you say, I'm allowed to do anything, but not everything is good for you. You say I'm allowed to do anything, but everything is not beneficial. The key to life is doing what is beneficial for living a life that glorifies God. That's what your investments should do. It should lead you to do things that glorify God. You want security, women? Wives? You want stability? You want abundance? You want satisfaction to know that things are with me. <laughs> Which is bringing us to our first principle. So I'm so glad you asked the answer to that question. Wives must invest their faith in obeying their husbands. If you want to experience all of the things that God has for you, your focus should be on investing in obeying your husband. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3. 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. Wives must invest their faith in obeying their husband. We're talking about believers, faith investing. See, God doesn't want you trying to invest in everything on the market. Just like in the stock market, there's different types of investments. There are some that have high yield. But in the stock market, they have high, high uh, chance of loss. Then you have some safe investments, but they give you a low return. Now, you could invest in your faith and not your husband's faith and obeying yourself. It'll give you a return, but it's a very low return. And it will not allow you to enjoy the abundance that Jesus said he came for us to have. First Peter chapter 3, verses 13 to 7. In the same way you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, so that even if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without their word by the behavior of their wives, as they observe your chaste and respectful behavior. But check what he said. He said, wives, look, I want you to obey your husbands, even if they don't obey the word. instruction is that for a Christian woman? To follow somebody that's not obeying the word? Surely the church teaches us that that's not so. He says, obey your husband even if they are not obedient to the word. Well, why do we struggle with obedience? Is that 1 Peter 3, 13-17? 1 through 2. I'm sorry. That's right, my commas got messed up and I put some mess in. <laughs> One, two, seven. <laughs> but you see what he says? But I want you to understand the investment he's asking you to make. Wives. He's asking you to put your faith in a man that doesn't know his word. If he doesn't know your, his word, how can he lead you into the things of God? Isn't that the struggle? Let's be honest. If he doesn't know the principles of properly handling money, raising a family, being the head and the provider, you still supposed to follow him? But that's what he said, didn't he? In case you thought he was only talking about Christian husbands that were submitted and committed to God. He says, look, I'm going to give you a challenge. I have this investment I want you to make. Now, it's risky. It looks risky on the surface. It looks like it could destroy you. But I'm telling you, it has one of the highest returns that you could ever invest in. Wow. Who could do such a thing? And there was a place before I came to know the Lord. Women would fight against such a thing. Church would teach it. Listen, you obey your husband if he follow the Lord. If he ain't follow the Lord, he a heathen. You ain't got to be there Sunday with him if he tell you. You come to church. Yeah. That dinner that you cook, you bring that to church this evening because yeah. we have a gather. Let him feed it for himself. Yeah. That's it. That's it. 
I experienced that. That's truth. That's not, that's not something I'm making up. Because there's no way God wants you following an ungodly man. But what does he say in the word? Mm -hmm. See, we want to shine a little light Amen. on the darkness yeah, that is permeated throughout the religious circles. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's causing divisions in the number one dis institution that is designed to affect the culture that we live in, which is the family. Say they ain't going to go out there and try to mess up every person. Why don't just mess up the head of that household first? Mess up that family. I got the community. And look at all your words. The biggest struggle in your world is because of people in it. Guess what? They came from somebody's family. See how smart the enemy is? We out here trying to fix all these messed up children, but nobody's going to the problem. That's like taking food off the tree again, you know? Yeah. But you let the tree stay. Go into that household! So if we send them back home, there's a good place to go to support what good they receive. But why if you are asked by God to invest in a man that don't even know God? And follow him. Yeah. Obey him. How can he know what to say if he ain't even talking from the word of God? You got to make it live in your mind. People. You have to see this word picture he's trying to get you to see. Invest your faith wise and just obeying your husband regardless. The more jacked up he is, the better off it'll be for you. <coughs> Quietly, without a word, and I know that there's a thing in the human nature that said, but there's sometimes we got to talk after you have mastered this principle. Because once you've mastered the principle, there will be no need or desire to talk. You will only talk when you have been told to by the ultimate master. Which is God, because he's trying to deliver us all from those things that prevent us from hearing him. And the thing that prevents us from hearing him is the fear of not having security, satisfaction, <coughs> stability, and abundance. Those are the things that challenge us from obeying God. And he's put things in place that you must overcome to trust him. Lord have mercy. Because he threw it there every now and then, as in the Lord. <laughs> Being you so faithful to Jesus. <laughs> Isn't he awesome? He's got a sense of humor, doesn't he? You say you love the Lord, huh? Obey your disobedient husband. Follow him. <laughs> Faithfully. Quietly. And you must act like the godly woman that you profess to be. With a gentle, quiet spirit. Because you have surrendered your well-being into the hands of a just and righteous God. Because you say you love him, right? And that's what it looks like. See, the wife has been given a responsibility by God to build a home as she submits to her husband's leadership. It is only here that she can attain assurance, stability, satisfaction, and security. And this is the only way for her to develop peace of mind that life is with. So even when we've been practicing our submission, we just can't quite get the internal peace of mind that we need, do we? I know you understand what I'm talking about. But there's some out there that are actually going through the motion, but they ain't got that internal, internal peace about it. Their mind got it. Their body's trying to make it happen, but their heart just can't be, mm, I don't know. I'm uncertain. <laughs> See, now you don't have internal peace because the three must agree. Mind, body, and spirit. And that's the evidence that you've been set free because it doesn't matter anymore. If it doesn't matter, why are we talking about it? That means you're over it. But it shows that you don't really believe that God is at work in all things for your good. Because that's why you can't come to terms with this thing of following somebody that don't know God. 
You just can't see how. Because you got verses like, how can a blind lead the blind? Because they all end up in a ditch, right? You know what they're going on in the back of some people's mind? I'm not here, but like, because we've been delivered. I can't be going to no ditch. I see you going the wrong way. Do you think Sarah did not know she was Abraham's husband? I mean, why? It may have slipped her mind in the heat of the moment. I'm sure she wasn't quite sure of what he was asking her to do. Even though he told her, she didn't really hear it. Listen, you're a beautiful woman. And there's a tradition here, a custom. The king and what he says goes. We're going to a place where the king loves beautiful women. And I thought, he's the king. It all starts and stops with him. Just to even look at the king cross-eyed at his motive for being killed. To question his desires and what he's trying to do is automatic death. So this is what we need to do, baby. We need to lie, pretend, manipulate, and deceive the king. Because that's what godly folks do when things get tight. Because surely God don't want us to die for standing on the truth. So today we lie. Today you my sister that I don't mind other folks having you. Because I know for a certain, as soon as we get in, when the king see you, he going to want you, he going to come take you. And if I'm a threat to that, he going to kill me. So what you, gonna, what you are going to do today, you didn't ask her. <laughs> what you are going to do today is tell him, you know, these people that you my sister. That's what's going to happen when we move into Egypt. You got that, baby? Now, what are we supposed to Who are you? I'm your sister, honey. What if they put pressure on you? I'm your sister. What if they want to kill you? I'm your sister. Because you obey your Lord. And what she say? Yes, Lord. If you don't understand, yes, Master. That's the, that's the, that's the uh, modern day version of what happens. In case you got messed up in the King James language and stuff, thou art, <laughs> thou beest, <laughs> okay? That's how it's, your husband will tell you. <laughs> okay, so you can be clear on the response that she made and the one you were supposed to make. Are you here with me? So you, you're clear on that, right? And God said, look, Sarah, trust him. <laughs> Just trust him, Sarah. I know he lied through his teeth. <laughs> but see, God wasn't really asking her to trust him. He was asking her to obey him. But trust God. I know he lied through his teeth. <laughs> but see, God wasn't really asking her to trust him. He was asking her to obey him. But trust God that he honors faithfulness. He honors your faith investment because that's how you build up your account. So that you won't get charged with insufficient faith when you get ready to stand on what you say you believe. Anybody got If you want to see what this woman, this wife looks like, you can look at Proverbs 31, 10 through 31. Talks about the virtuous woman. See, this is the greatest investment that a wife can make to attain the abundant life that Jesus promises. This investment will reveal your love or lack of love for God more than anything else in life you do. You want to know where you stand wise with God? Just see where you stand with your husband. It'll show your love for God or your lack of love. In those areas in which you struggle with your husband, you are actually struggling with trusting God. Because God says, who, who's going to want to harm you anyway if God be for you? Who can harm you? But even if you suffer for doing what is right, oh, you said, wait a minute, whoa. You 
you trying to tell me after all this faith and this no word for my husband I still might have to suffer suffering might be just what you need and doing what is right to make sure that it's real and it ain't just conditional but even if you suffer for doing what is right God will reward you for it so don't worry or be afraid of their threats. Instead, you must worship Christ as Lord of your life. And if someone asks about your insanity, I mean, okay, your, your, your Christian hope. <laughs> Always be ready to explain it. <laughs> Always explain. Why are you following that man? You know he don't know God. Out here homeless, we're following him. Yeah, amen. <laughs> That's the problem, man. Amen. Even though you're faithful, you yeah. still might have to suffer. Yeah. And that's the little hidden thing way back there. But do this in a gentle and respectful way. <laughs> so I guess we gotta get away from I'm ducking. <laughs> I'm sorry I put that in y'all mind. Yeah. <laughs> Well, you got to stand up and hit me. Yeah. Stand up, I'm taking one for the team. Yeah. Taking one for the team. I know my baby got issues, but he's my baby. Yeah, I got faith in God that he's going to fix it through me doing this. Yeah. Hit me. That's it. That's it. I got a God that protects me. And even when I suffer, he's going to reward me. Wow. Then, if people speak against you, <laughs> call you crazy, <laughs> foolish, insane, ungodly, they will, they will be ashamed when they see what a good life you live because you belong to Christ and you made a solid faith investment. See, a lot of times when people are making investments, there are people that tell them they're crazy. It's too risky. It ain't worth the gamble of the return that you're going to get. You can't rest at night when you make those types of investments. In the world, you can. But in God, you can. Because He's promised you're going to win whether you suffer or you don't. <laughs> He's going to take care of you. What kind of investments are you making in your wife and your husband? Remember, it is better to suffer for doing good if that is what God wants than to suffer for doing wrong. But what has the enemy told us? He has told us as a society that pain is a bad thing. So much so they have developed medicines to keep you from experiencing pain, which is the <laughs> worst thing that could have ever happened yeah, to you. That's it. Because that will not fix the problem. You need to fix the problem. You need to fix the problem of asking yourself, why do I fear totally obey and following my husband's decision. You have to ask yourself, what is this? Don't take a pain pill. Don't pretend you're following him. Don't get to know him so well that you are making decisions that he think he's making. Mm -hmm. Well, he think he's in charge and you know you really want to call the shot. Don't do that. That's a pain pill that's going to cause you to get addicted but never be cured. One day, if he continues to follow the Lord, and the Lord continues to work with you, did, he's going to step up and demand this position one day. Yes. And if you got hooked on that pain medicine of pretending, you're going to have issues. You're going to find yourself undermining one another, having conflict, division. <clears throat> See, you don't need to be worried about how others are growing. <laughs> You need to be concerned about how I am I growing so that I can handle whatever storm comes my way. So, wives must invest their faith in obeying your husband if you want to attain assurance that you are glorifying God, which is characterized by stability, satisfaction, and security, which produces the peace of mind that God is well pleased with. You want to know whether God is pleased with you or not? Just ask yourself, how am I 
in the obedience category to my husband. And I know you single women are saying, thank God I ain't married in places like that. Well, I got one for you too. <laughs> Christ is your husband. Yeah, that's it. That means this word is for you. Yeah. If you ain't married to a knucklehead like one of us in here, yeah. you got one that ain't a knucklehead. His name is Jesus. He wrote the same word to you <laughs> that he wrote to all of us. Your faith must be in trusting God's word. And to add a little flavor to that for the single women, how many of you have turned down your husband already that God sent you? Because he didn't line up with what you thought your flavor for a husband was. <laughs> I know, I ain't that something. That can't be the one, God. Because you hear what Nathan said? It don't line up with nothing I'm after. Isn't it human nature what got you to where you are? <laughs> I know, it ain't too funny, but it's funny to me. I'm married. <laughs> I'm just messing with you. I feel for you. I feel for you. I really do. But I, I want to commend you. You look well. I won't dig. Because you look well. I believe it's well. Therefore, it will be well. <laughs> the rest is between you and God. Because if you can master that one, hey, I mean, the rest should be a piece of cake. Oh, you could be so focused on mastering that one, you just can't figure nothing else out. <laughs> I don't know. But well, I know you're good because God got you where you're at because that's what works for you at this point in time. In verse 19, husbands are told to love their wives and not be embittered against them. The Greek term for love carries the meaning of embracing the judgment and deliberate agreement of your will. You heard that, husband? Mm -hmm. You want me to say it again? The Greek term for love carries the meaning of embracing the, in, embracing the judgment. Judgment. Judgment of the fact that I got to love my wife through in Christ as Christ loved the church. And deliberately coming into agreement with that truth in your will. With your will. Not, a, not as a commander, but as a desire. My will says I want to love my wife yep. like Christ loved the church. That's it. As a principle of existence, not something that you can give or take. It is the way of the husband. It's not an option. It's from God. And it's your duty and it's how you conform to the biblical principles and disciplines of love. Where the mind, body, and spirit are in total agreement with that belief. So you got to stop saying stuff so, where, you know, that's just the way she is. Hey, that's just the way you is. That's why God telling you both is. This is how you inches on me. Yeah. If you want to go to heaven. Either you is or you ain't. Which is you? Husbands must love their wives. Then he says, don't be embittered against them. What does it mean to be embittered against your wife? What does it mean? It carries the meaning of resentment or the strong and painful bitterness you feel when you believe someone has done you wrong. <laughs> Guys had a saying before we come to know the Lord. It's at these places you just want to smush your wife sometimes. They just smush her in the face. <laughs> You're just like, shut up! Stop! Get the feet off the floor so they can understand you're serious. You hear that supernatural strength. <laughs> well, I know you have a cool, but I think the men are feeling yeah. at 
one time. You get what I'm saying? <laughs> and it's just not here. It's a worldwide thing. It's a, it's a worldwide feeling. It's just like it's a worldwide feeling about missing socks. Yeah. Yeah. That's a worldwide. I did not realize it. Yeah. You check across the world yes. when you talk to husbands about some of the things they struggle with. One of the top things that the list is missing socks. Yes. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, but then they show up out of the blue three, yes. four months later. Yeah. Yeah. That's it. Y'all think I'm kidding, but this, I mean, these are some of the things that men talk about. Yeah. This yeah. is socks. Socks, man. I know some of you all have that. You got the pants and put them together. That sounds so. Socks. <laughs> put them together so you don't lose them. Yeah. Figure out how to keep up with them. Yeah. But you came with the pants for a reason. <laughs> See, it's, it's common. Men, why do you think they come with books like Women Up for Mars and Men, or Men for Venus or the Vice Versa? You know what I'm talking about, Women Up for Venus? Men for Mars? Do you know how out of world that is? It's like you're from a place where I've never been. What do I know about it? Why has mankind come up with such analogies when it comes to husband and wives? Because they're not making the right faith investment in the relationship. They're going into the marriage because they thought the marriage was the investment. Mm -hmm. And they go into the marriage looking for a return on their decision to marry you. So you come in with all these expectations of what you're supposed to be getting because you're married. <laughs> I know you have a clue what I'm talking about. But there are some people that think that we married now. And what they say is we made an investment. And this is what I'm expecting on my return. Anybody got a return list that you're still trying to get fulfilled because you're married? Some of you may not be married because your list did not get fulfilled. But see, you did make the right investment in the marriage. So husbands, you are told to love your wives without embittering them. <sighs> you know, you say go right, they say left. So they just don't trust nothing you say. They talk better than you do. You can't help talk to them, so you get frustrated. <laughs> They constantly want to answer that you don't have a clue. <laughs> you didn't even know that question exists. <laughs> so you get frustrated because you thought they understood you. Because they married you. <laughs> Why would you marry somebody that's stupid? <laughs> you get what I'm saying? <laughs> we thought you knew us. <laughs> we grunted when we were dating. We didn't talk. <laughs> but you thought it was so cute then. <laughs> now you want me to use words. Words? Are you serious? <laughs> I had to show we had to talk. He laid across the bed and took a nap. So told everybody to shut up. That's what I do. Be quiet. <laughs> I know. So they become embittered, resentful. Yeah. She get on my nerve. Just when she just be quiet sometimes. I always got to say something. I go buy bubble gum. I'm scared to go home till I bought bubble gum. Why you buy bubble gum? <laughs> I know y'all, but me and y'all don't understand. These guys are so up. <laughs> they ain't got no assurance about nothing. <laughs> Only thing they're assured of is this. You are not going to agree with it. <laughs> That's before you got to live. Yes. <coughs> Which brings us to our second principle. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> Believe it's like investment. <laughs> it's 
especially husband, how to get the greatest return on your investment in your wife. <laughs> So you're supposed to be training your family. 
and what God looks like. In verse 20, we are told to children are told to obey their parents in all things. In order to please God, of all things that we can do for God, obedience is God's number one preference. He desires obedience above all else. An obedient mindset is developed during childhood. Now we understand the importance of raising children, but we need to understand how we're supposed to be raising them. As parents, our focus should be teaching our children to obey and follow instructions. Nothing else matters. Because if you master this one, young people, you grew up to be adults that are already practicing the things of God. Childhood, childhood is devoted strictly to developing obedience. Nothing else. Faith investment skills Development starts here. Faith is all about following instruction. This is what God means about raising up children in the way that they must go. Everything that we will ever do in life comes with instructions. Everything that you're going to ever do comes with a set of instructions. And it comes with somebody giving those instructions. So the thing that we're supposed to be focusing on with our children is to make sure they obey and follow instructions and show respect to authority. But look what the world has us distracted in in trying to raise our children. Everything that is needed to teach your child to obey, Satan has subtly, through his world system, making these things illegal. Illegal. Slowly but surely. But God knew that was coming, right? Mm -hmm. So that means you must get wiser mm -hmm. to be able to do what you do and do it in a way that glorifies God. Which brings us to our third principle. We're talking about believers' faith and investment. Children must invest their faith in obeying their parents. Children, your number one focus in life now should be focus on obeying your parents. How could that be such a invest good investment? How could that be beneficial to me? Proverbs 1, 8 and 9. My child, it says, Do not neglect your mother's instruction. What you learn from them will crown you with grace and be a chain of honor around your neck. This is God talking to you, young people, to obey your, your parents. See, because you have to understand that everything you do in life is going to require you to follow instructions and to be obedient. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Could it be parents that as adults we are not practicing obedience ourselves? Could that be the problem? <clears throat> Scripture teaches that the student is not above his teacher. Amen. You have to understand that your child's character, your character was developed at home. That's where it's developed. But thank God, God is showing us now how to move into this realm and deal with these issues that the enemy has used to lead us to make bad investments in our, in our faith. Excuse me. We're putting our faith that our children are going to be all right. But are you putting your faith and investment in training them in what that looks like? But you could be too busy. You could be spending your faith in areas that don't give a good return. You may be spending your faith in helping them become a great superstar or someone one day. That's a very low return. Because all these things is what God has promised to give us. You know, we don't have to put the time in that the world puts in to be great and successful if our faith and trust is in God and we honor God in our lives. Luke 6, 40-42. A pupil is not above his teacher, but everyone, after he has been fully trained, will be like his teacher. Why do you look at the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the law that is in your own eye? Teachers, trainers, parents, as you're training your children, you've got to first make sure that you can do it. Because it's spiritual. The only 
authority that you have in your life is the authority that's in Christ or the authority that is in Satan. You're going to serve one or the other. That's why we work to make sure that we have been delivered to walk in the righteousness that God has given us. In verse 21, before we move on, those children, you must invest your time in obeying your parents. Nothing else matters. That's your number one priority if you want to live a long and productive life and make sure everything is going to go well with you. It's to obey your parents. In verse 21, fathers, you are told not to provoke your children to anger or doing what is wrong, which causes them to get discouraged. So how do you provoke your children to anger, which leads to discouragement? How do you do it? Because are you not really trying, are you? But you know, the, one of the most frustrating things in life is trying to accomplish something that you are not knowledgeable or skilled to do. You ever been stuck in that place where you've been trying to do something, you just didn't know how to do it? But you got demands on you? Like when you get a new job at your first start, you got some of those business that expect you to do that production right up front, but it takes you a while to get the techniques and skills down. And through that 90 day period, you may get fired because you just didn't meet the muster. Some of you have been taking 91 days. You got fired on the 90th day. You were right there. And that's frustrating. And a lot of times we're putting our children in places that is frustrating because we haven't trained them properly. And that's our responsibility. We must remember that we were all born into Satan's kingdom with a fallen nature that has been trained to serve Satan and his agenda. You were born without the capacity to do what is right. Romans 6, 20 and 21. We were all born without the capacity to do right. Romans 6, 20 and 21. When you were slaves to sin, you were free from the obligation to do right. That's what it says. When you were born into this world, you were free from the obligation to do right. Before you can even consider raising your child in the things of God, you must first bind the strong man that owns them and controls you when you were born into this world. Matthew 12, 29. Matthew 12, 29. If Satan cast out Satan, he is divided against himself. How then will his kingdom stand? If I by Beelzebub cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? For this reason, they will be your judges. But if I cast out demons by the Spirit of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Or how can anyone enter the strong man's house and carry off his property unless he first binds the strong man, and he will then be able to plunder his house? What is he saying? How can you, in the spirit of Satan, cast Satan out of your children or anyone else? How can you lead anyone else out of Satan's control when you are already under his control? Now, Satan will pretend that this is happening to make you think that you're in line with God. But you are the one that knows whether these characteristics of the fallen nature control your behavior or not. You can't deliver anybody until you're first able to bind Satan. Well, how do you bind him? You got to first take the board or the plank out of your own eye. You got to remove the control of the enemy in your life before you can help deliver anybody else uh, from the control that Satan has in their lives. Now, you get what I'm saying? So, God, in His awesome wisdom, trains us by giving us things to do. You were the first thing that He gave you. That's why it all starts with you. See, a lot of times we're trying to deliver our kids when we're the problem. Because <coughs> we have allowed the spirits to rule into our house. If you master that spirit, he has nowhere to live. To be gone. But you have to have authority over him. How do you have authority over him? You must master him in your life. And so many times we're focusing on trying to help others get delivered. We don't realize just that thought itself is the evidence that the enemy is working in us. Because mm -hmm. it shows that we're trying to do the work of God. Yes. This is what we're talking about. We have to learn how to train our children in the things of God. Because God desires obedience more than anything else. Which brings us to our next principle. Fathers. You must invest your faith in training your children, not barking out commands based on your expectations. 
That's what you have to put faith in. I'm going to put faith, my faith in that if I train you properly, that you're going to not move away from the things that you've been learning. Well, how are we going to train you? How do we do it? Proverbs 22, 6 says, Train up a child in the way he should go. Even when he is old, he will not depart from it. You hear what it said? It just said they will depart from it and come back after they get old. It says you train them up in the way they go, they will not depart from it. Even if they get older, they're not going to depart from it. It's going to become their way of life. But are we training them in the things that we need to train them in? Proverbs 21, 22, and 23. A wise man scales the city of the mighty and brings down the stronghold in which they trust. He who guards his mouth and his tongue guards his soul from trouble. A wise man recognizes the stronghold that Satan has established around him. And he learns how to climb that wall to turn down those strongholds. He learns how to go in so that he can set the captives free. God makes us grow by giving us responsibility. The responsibility begins with exercising proper management over what God has entrusted us with. The measure of your spiritual maturity is how you care for what God has entrusted you. Children are a gift from God. He's entrusted them to you. And he's expecting you to train them. You must recognize the strongholds that Satan has set up in your child's mind and start the process of training your child how to bring those thoughts captive to the obedience of the word. It's, it's more than just telling them. You got to now show them how to master these places, how to take authority in those places, how to walk in victory in those places. You have to show them by example and dealing with them and talking with them and training them on a daily basis. 2 Corinthians 10, 3 through 5 talks about that. Even though we walk in the flesh, we do not wage war in the flesh. But our weapons are powerful and strong. For the turn down of strongholds, thoughts, and imaginations that stand up against the things of God. See, you must be, you must, husbands, fathers, you must invest in training your children in spiritual warfare. That's what you should be doing. You should be training your children in spiritual warfare. When you're looking at TV, this is how you're studying your opponent. And you're telling them. And you don't look at TV as a hobby. As a pastime. You use it to look at pros and say, look, this is how the enemy is working against you. You see that right there? That is designed to lead you away from God. This is how he's subtle. You saw the little picture that flashed in the background that went right away? That's called sublineal training, which he uses to plant thoughts in our minds that we don't even recognize we saw. Yeah, that's it. You notice, you see the things that are happening on TV. You see how it, what the Word of God says. And you see how this right here is moving children and people away from the things of God. That's why you have to be careful with this thing right here. It is designed to move you away from God. It doesn't matter even if it's a spiritual picture. How, why do you say that, Pastor Palmer? Because yeah. it goes totally against God's method of teaching. Yeah. Faith comes by Hearing comes by. We don't travel by. We travel by. What is TV designed to do? Sight. Anything that's designed to make you travel and work by sight is not from God. Because what does that do? It prevents you from following instruction. You start to follow by what you see. That looks like, what's the biggest thing? Because, see, the enemy understands the concept. A little leaven. Leaven's the whole lot. I don't need all y'all act like you're crazy and sinful. If I could just get one in here, if I could just get one that doesn't follow the principles of God, I can get my work done. If the man of God is sleeping. We should be training our people in spiritual warfare, using the tools of the enemy because we understand how he works. So we're supposed to reveal his doctrines and his tricks. And we're supposed to be training our children in a way that 
they can recognize the enemy because they know the truth so well. But they see how he works. When you start recognizing those behaviors that you know he's going to use to cause them to be unsuccessful, what should you be doing? Not barking out commands on not to do that, but show them spiritually how to do this. So a lot of people don't even know that you're teaching. Yeah. But who's like, who likes class? It's life every day. It's life every day that we are trained to become all that God has called us to be. In verse 22 through 24, servants, employees, or slaves are told to obey their masters here on earth in all things from a sincere heart because of reverence for the Lord. This is all about motivation. Why do you do what you do? 1 Peter 2, 18 through 20. Servants, be submissive to your masters with all respect, not only to those who are good and gentle, but also to those who are unreasonable. For this finds favor, for for the sake of conscience toward, a, toward God, a person bears up under sorrows and suffering unjustly. For what credit is there if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with patience? But if when you do what is right and suffer for it, suffer for it, you patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. You're supposed to be trained how to operate in all these environments and still glorify God. And how do you do that? You make the right faith investment. I'm going to invest in obeying my employers and treating this business like it's God's business. And I'm going to carry myself like it's God's business. And it doesn't matter what they do because the real boss is God, but I'm going to obey them to show them that I'm here to serve God, not my own agenda. Which brings us to our next principle as we learn more about believers' investments, faith investments. You must invest your faith in obeying those in authority. See, you notice the areas that he touched on here today? As Paul is dealing with the issues that are going on in church, he's dealt with your relationship, your attitude, your relationship with God, your commitment to God. Now he's talking about faith in the areas of your family and your workplace. Think about those areas in your life and what they mean to your life. Your workplace is where you go to have that audience to be a servant for God. I mean, get your paycheck, right? Thank God we deliver. We understand now, right? That's why we give honor to God because we want to be able to be there as long as God needs us to be there to do the work God wants us to do there. Because we know that we are there to serve God and show people how they're supposed to operate, not only in good conditions, but unfavorable conditions, in a way that gives respect and honor and glory to God. That's who we are. That's how we show the world what God looks like. You must invest your faith in obeying those in authority. Ephesians 6, 5 through 8. Slaves, be obedient to those who are your masters according to the flesh with fear and trembling. In the security and the sincerity of your heart, as to Christ, not by way of eye service as men pleasers, but as slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from the heart. With good will, render service as to the Lord, and not to men, knowing that whatever good things each one does, this he will receive back from the Lord, whether slave or free. You must invest in honoring and obeying your employer in all things at all times. See, these are the major investments that you can make in your life. If you want to assure that you have assurance, Abundance, stability, satisfaction. That's what we all seek in life anyway. And these are the areas in life that you need to give your main focus to for with faith. Look at the promises that come with them. The promises fulfill everything in life that you would ever want to pursue. And even things that you would never even imagine because we don't know even the things that God has in store for those that love it. And we call according to his purpose. 
your greatest investment as we look at the application is in relationships. Your relationship with God and mankind. Because of what arena you find yourself in, you should be focusing on investing your faith in those relationships. It will require you to practice principles and truths that will deliver you from that fallen mindset, which will move you into a mindset and behavior that glorifies God. What are you investing your faith in? What are you believing God for, in other words? Are you believing God for a job or a career or this and that? That's a low return investment. Your faith investment should be focused on obedience to the standards according to what you say you believe and who you follow. Where is your faith being invested? Cut the clutter out of your life. All of those things you've been focusing on with faith for and trying to do, cut all that out and realize if I focus on these areas right here and invest my faith into doing obedience here and doing what God told me here, Everything else in life will line up. Everything else will happen. 